Welcome to What You Want to Know About Spinal Cord Injuries, where I answer the most common questions you have about spinal cord injuries. Today, we're talking about autonomic dysfunction and autonomic dysreflexia. In the first episode, I explained that a spinal cord injury is so much more than just the inability to walk. And what we're talking about today is a really good example of what I was trying to impart with that statement. All right, the autonomic nervous system, what does it do? Well, the autonomic nervous system regulates blood pressure, heart rate, temperature regulation, digestion, among other things. And this is really important for people with thoracic level injuries at the sixth vertebra, so T6 injuries and higher. People with lower level injuries, this typically does not apply to them. So this is for people with cervical level injuries and higher thoracic level injuries. Blood pressure has a tendency to be lower. So the baseline blood pressure will be lower. And it's usually an average between 100 and 110 will be the systolic number or that upper number. So when we say 100 over 80. With the blood pressure this low, it can be difficult to do activities of daily living. So just sitting up in bed, getting dressed, it's really easy to get winded and lightheaded. And so there are a couple different ways to manage low blood pressure. The first one is taking a medication called midadrine, and this will increase someone's blood pressure. The other option is taking Sudafed. Some people will just take over-the-counter Sudafed and it has a similar effect to the midodrine for them. I will just try to stay really well hydrated. That has a tendency to work well for me. I didn't like the way that the medication made me feel. And then the two other options are using an abdominal binder or compression stockings. So these are all ways that are effective in at least maintaining a halfway decent blood pressure. The heart rate for people with higher level spinal cord injuries can also be lower. And this is really difficult when we're trying to exercise. During exercise, someone with a higher level spinal cord injury may max out at a heart rate of between 100 to 130. And this is much lower than an able-bodied individual. And this impacts exercise, not only because you can't get a great cardiovascular workout, but it also impacts the ability to work out. So just cramping up and then your body just isn't able to get the oxygen and blood that it needs and your brain. So blood pressure, heart rate, and temperature regulation. Temperature regulation is really interesting. I kind of try to describe it as being a cold blooded animal. If my surroundings are cold, I have a tendency to get very cold and very chilled. If my surroundings are warm, I'm going to be warm. So the environment that I'm in plays a really big part of what my body temperature is. In the mornings, my body temperature can be as low as 95 and that's somewhat normal for me. Throughout the day, it will go up, but in the mornings, my body temperature will be really low. I'm typically bundled up in layers. And if you've ever been around someone with a spinal cord injury, you probably have seen them dressed in layers or chilled even when it's not that cold outside. In warm temperatures, body temperature regulation, I feel is even more difficult. And that's because the autonomic nervous system controls sweating. And so someone with a higher level spinal cord injury is incapable of sweating. So therefore, the body temperature is just going to go up and up and up because there's no way for the body to cool itself off. A lot of people will have a spray bottle um, that they'll just use to mimic sweat or maybe a cold washcloth or towel. And those are some ways that people try to prevent their body temperature from going up too high. What does this look like in real life? Well, I love to row. So throughout the summer, I will get up at about 5.30 or 6 o'clock in the morning so I can be down on the river by about 8 o'clock in the morning. And I do this to avoid the heat. I live in an area that's hot and humid. So the earlier I get on the river, the more heat I can avoid. So I get in the boat. Um, I'll put on an abdominal binder to help with my blood pressure. But once I push off into the river and start to row, 
my blood pressure plummets and even with the binder on. And so I'll get lightheaded. I can start seeing stars if it's really bad. And I also start cramping up really badly because my heart can't keep up with pumping that blood and oxygen to the rest of my body. Within five or 10 minutes, this does regulate. It gets to a point where I can maintain a good level of exercise. But that's not the end of the story because we have to head back to heat again and temperature regulation. One good example of this is at a regatta that I was at about a year ago. My race was scheduled for two o'clock in the afternoon and as a quad, I knew this was not gonna be good. We were in Philadelphia, it was in the low 90s with high humidity and I knew it was gonna be a tough race. So got out on the water, we rode up 700 meters to the start, rode a thousand meter race and then sat on the water. It took us about 20 minutes to get into the dock. By the time I got back into my chair and took my temperature, my temperature was 103 degrees Fahrenheit. So within an hour, hour and a half, my body temperature raised that much simply due to being in the heat. Let's move on to autonomic dysreflexia. Autonomic dysreflexia happens when there's an irritant below the level of injury and it's sending signals to your body that's saying, hey, something's wrong down here and you need to do something about it. So let's use the example of a full bladder. So bladder is full, it sends a signal to the sympathetic nervous system, which is the fight or flight part of the nervous system. It says, we've got a problem, we need to take care of this. So blood vessels constrict, which shoots the blood pressure up. In able-bodied individuals, signal would go to the brain and the brain would say, hey, we need to chill down here a little bit. Let's lower the heart rate and let's lower the blood pressure by dilating the blood vessels. Well, because of the level of injury being at T6 or above that, those messages can't get past that level to get down to where the irritant is. There are other symptoms of dysreflexia as well. And these can include goosebumps, uh, blurred vision, a stuffy nose, a pounding heart. So there's a lot of different ways that your body is trying to let you know that something is wrong. I actually like to call autonomic dysreflexia God's emergency backup system because it's trying to let you know that something's wrong, but you are responsible for figuring out what that is. The most common causes of autonomic dysreflexia are bladder, a full bladder, bowel issues, and then probably skin would be next on that list. So maybe my clothes are bunched up or my shoes aren't on correctly. Maybe I dropped something in my lap. Um, I have set a hot plate on my lap before and gotten dysreflexic and just not put two and two together. And I took my pants off that night and I had a blister on my legs because the plate was too hot. And so our body will try to tell us that something's wrong, but we're responsible for trying to figure out, looking at bladder, bowel, skin, and other things to see what's wrong. So how is autonomic dysreflexia defined? Well, it's high blood pressure, right? But let's go back to the beginning where I mentioned that the baseline for people with higher level spinal cord injuries is between 100 and 110. Autonomic dysreflexia is typically 20 to 40 millimeters of mercury higher than your baseline. So if my baseline is 100, a systolic blood pressure of 120 to 140 would be an episode of autonomic dysreflexia. This is where this confuses a lot of medical professionals because they'll see a blood pressure of 130 or 120 and go, there's no problem with that. Meanwhile, I have a splitting headache and I'm going, there's a major problem here. If left untreated, autonomic dysreflexia can cause a stroke, heart attack, and even death. So it's really important to be on top of it and to be able to treat the irritant that is causing the episode of autonomic dysreflexia. So what should someone do if they're experiencing an episode of autonomic dysreflexia? The first thing to do is to sit up. So if the person is in bed, laying flat, get them seated upright. Hopefully that will lower the blood pressure a little bit. 
So check the bladder, make sure the bladder isn't full, make sure that a Foley catheter isn't kinked, um, make sure that the bowels are not full or don't need to be emptied, and then finally start checking the skin. If that doesn't help, it may be necessary to use a medication called nitropaste. And nitropaste will decrease the blood pressure, but it's very important to know how to use nitropaste correctly. If it's used incorrectly, blood pressure can actually bottom out. So talk with your doctor, see if it's something that you should have on hand and know how to use it properly. I have been in a situation where medical professionals have blown me off when I'm experiencing autonomic dysreflexia. And there was one time I was in the hospital. I had just pushed down to get an x-ray because we knew something was wrong somewhere, but we were just trying to figure it out. But I started experiencing some autonomic dysreflexia. I got a horrible headache. My blood pressure was really high. I was sweating. And remember, I can't sweat. So when I come to the point that I'm sweating, I know something's wrong. So I pushed myself out to the nurse's station. I said, there's something really wrong that's going on with me. I don't know what it is. And I think you might need to call my doctor. Well, she just told me to go back into my room and I overheard her tell another nurse, oh, she's just tired from pushing down to x-ray by herself. <sighs> I was so frustrated. I knew that there was a problem. Remember, autonomic dysreflexia is a life-threatening condition. So you need to get this taken care of and get it under control. All right, so we've talked about autonomic dysfunction and autonomic dysreflexia. I'm gonna throw in a little added bonus for you. And this is something called boosting. It's probably something a lot of you haven't heard of before. Boosting is a doping method used by athletes with spinal cord injuries. Athletes will actually in purposefully induce autonomic dysreflexia to help their sports performance. Well, why would someone purposefully induce autonomic dysreflexia? Well, it's going to increase your blood pressure, it's going to increase your heart rate, and it's going to improve your performance. Some of the ways that athletes boost through autonomic dysreflexia include allowing their bladder to be overfull prior to competition, tightening leg straps or other straps too tight to a point where it will induce pain, some men have been known to either sit incorrectly on or twist their scrotum to induce AD. And, and there's one man who has actually broken his toe prior to competition to have an episode of autonomic dysreflexia. Since 2004, the International Paralympic Committee has banned boosting. And in 2006, they came out with this statement. With immediate effect, any athlete found with a systolic blood pressure reading of over 160 millimeters of mercury at a competition will not be allowed to compete on health grounds. This statement was released by the International Paralympic Committee after an eight year study on boosting. So there's your little tidbit of information that I bet you probably didn't know and may not even want to know about. So we've talked about autonomic dysfunction and how the autonomic nervous system controls blood pressure, heart rate, temperature regulation, and digestion, and autonomic dysreflexia, and a little bit about boosting. If you have a question about spinal cord injuries, put your question in the comment section below and I'll see if I can answer what you want to know about spinal cord injuries. Don't forget to subscribe to the channel so that you know when the next episode is released. Until next time. Thank you.